Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. I'm A.J. Hogue, author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Join my VIP program, EffortlessEnglishClub.com effortlessenglishclub.com go there to speak english fluently we got a got an interview today with acharya again yay acharya ji good we're going to uh today we're going to talk about his book the dharma manifesto which is a really interesting book a new vision for global transformation is what it's called the dharma manifesto is the d- book we'll be discussing with the author with the writer uh, let's just go ahead. I'm going to call him right now on Skype. Let's get started. I don't like to waste time. Let's do it. Okay. Let's see. Look at Skype on my screen. Okay. I think you all can see the screen. As usual, I'll talk to Acharya. I'll ask him questions. And then I'll go to, uh, I'll try to have save time so that those of you who are watching live, you can uh, ask questions also. We can do some of your questions. So let me just go ahead and call now. Oh, I gotta do this camera. All right, there we go. Hello, hello, (laughs) Acharya Ji. Nice to see you again. Namaste. (laughs) Namaste. It's absolutely wonderful seeing you, AJ. How are you? Good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, It's been a while, so I'm I'm glad we can. for doing this again. It's really wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I truly appreciate it. And uh, congratulations. I know you just had a, a conference in uh, in uh, Nebraska. Sorry, I couldn't make it this time. I hope to do it in the future. Certainly. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it was very successful. Actually, it was a weekend conference just ended a few days ago. It was very nice. It was called the International Sanatana Dharma Conference. And uh, Of course, you know, all the borders being closed, we couldn't get quite as many international people as we wanted. Otherwise, we would have had three times as many people. But it was very successful in every way. And in fact, starting next week, we'll be releasing several of the videos of several talks I gave from that conference. So people can be on the lookout for that. Excellent. Excellent. Today, we're going to talk about... uh your book, The Dharma Manifesto, which is a fantastic book. I'm really uh, excited to talk about this. Um, Thank you. There's there's so much in the book to talk about. So um, why don't uh, I'm just going to let, as usual, I'll let you do most of the talking. So if you could just introduce the book, uh, you know, what kind of give your summary of, of what is the Dharma Manifesto about and uh, why do you think it's important? Certainly, definitely. Well, again, thank you for the opportunity Uh, For those who don't know, this is the book here, actually, the Dharma Manifesto. And this book was initially published in 2013, so not very long ago, about seven years ago. Uh, It's been extremely successful since it came out. But maybe let me talk a little bit about the background first, as far as why I decided to write the Dharma Manifesto. As you and I believe many people in your audience, audience know, of course, primarily I'm a spiritual teacher. That's what I do is I speak about spirituality and from the Vedic perspective, the perspective of Sanatana Dharma, and I teach meditation, Vedic philosophy, etc., etc. But as I've mentioned many times before, and interestingly, uh, this video that will come out of one of my talks from the previous conference a few days ago, uh, in that talk, I talk about this a little bit. The wonderful thing about the Vedic worldview is that it covers every aspect of the human experience, every aspect. Certainly that includes the spiritual slash religious, philosophical, cultural, etc. But it also does indeed include the political. And what I've seen over the many decades that I've been studying and practicing the Vedic tradition is that sadly very few people who even practice the Vedic tradition really know anything about what is the Vedic view on politics. And what's interesting is that like with every other aspect of the human experience, the Vedic tradition has (laughs) a lot to say about politics like it does about everything else. But again, for many decades, what I've seen is that 
even people who seriously follow Sanatana Dharma know nothing about the political views of Sanatana Dharma. For example, what does an ideal government look like? Uh, what are uh, Vedic policies on specific issues like the economy, like uh, social justice, things like this? What, what does Sanatana Dharma actually have to say about politics per se? Uh, because so few individuals who follow Vedic spirituality, because so few of them know what it is that the Vedic tradition says about politics, what ends up happening is that, of course, they kind of fill in that void with a lot of speculation. And what I've seen over the years is that to my great disappointment and the disappointment of individuals who know Sanatana Dharma very well, they fill in that void with a lot of modern nonsense, with a lot of modernistic uh, sort of nonsense, including specifically a lot of ideas that are actually rooted in atheism, that are actually rooted in materialism. Again, it's a vacuum. People just did not understand what Vedic politics were, so what would they fill it in with? Marxist-inspired ideology, mm -hmm. you know, any, everything from liberalism to leftism to socialism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, not understanding that even at a very quick cursory glance at the Vedic literature, what you very quickly find out, very quickly, is that traditional, that is authentic Sanatana Dharma is 100% absolutely opposed to all of these materialistic ideologies. So again, this is what I saw for many, many years. So I saw that this was a vacuum that needed to be filled and people needed to understand, all right, what are Vedic, what is Vedic political philosophy? What does it look like? What would a Vedic government look like, et cetera, et cetera? Except instead of making this merely theoretical, what I decided to do was to write a practical manifesto. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thus, that's why it's called the Dharma Manifesto, where it's meant to be something very practical. That is, what would a Vedic government look like today in the 21st century? if indeed you were to take the principles of dharma and instantiate them politically. So this is how the book came about. And after doing a lot of writing, then finally I was approached by this uh, wonderful publishing company called Arctos, and they asked me if I would uh, publish it through them. And that's how the book came about in uh, 2013, so about seven years ago. And again, as I said, since the book was published, it has been extremely popular. It's been read by uh, many, 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 many thousands of people in many, in many different circles, including a lot of very powerful circles, interestingly, mm -hmm. including individuals who are in politics, individuals who are political leaders, intellectuals, scholars, leaders of movements, various political movements have read this book, etc. And, you know, we can go more into that later if necessary. But as far as what the book is about, let me talk about that a little bit. Essentially, there is indeed the idea of dharma. Again, going back to the name, the Dharma Manifesto. The idea of dharma is something that is not tied to any, let's say, sectarian or denominational sort of concern. It's not that when you say dharma, it's like saying, oh, my religion is X, you know, whatever my religion is. Rather, the concept of dharma is something that is very philosophical, scientific, universal, almost mathematical. The idea of dharma very simply is natural law. And natural law is a concept that has been recognized by all the ancient cultures of the world. Indeed, even by some somewhat more recent cultures, you know, even, for example, in Catholicism. Uh, they have their own tradition of what they call natural law. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit more legalistic. Hmm. But still, the idea of natural law is something that, again, is not something that is pertaining just to one religion or another. Rather, it's the universal concept that there are natural laws, indeed, that are there inherent in the universe, that are discoverable, that are universally applicable, that is, they can be applied at, at, at any place, at any time, that these laws are eternal, etc. And this is the thing that's interesting, is that at one time, especially in the ancient world, let's say uh, roughly at least 2,000 years ago, and then even older than that, in the ancient world, almost every government on earth, whether it was a king, whether it was a republic like Athens, whatever, whatever sort of government we can talk about, Almost every government at least 
tried to govern in accordance with this natural law, in accordance with Dharma. So what this idea is, is with the Dharma Manifesto to look at exactly how did these ancient governments govern? How did they apply natural law in a way that made sense, that benefited their people, that brought about, let's say, the optimal uh, the optimal success of their people in every way, culturally, uh, economically, spiritually, etc., and how to apply these natural law principles today in a way where we don't have to go back literally to the ancient ways of kings and queens. See, the idea is that we recognize that, yes, we are living in modernity, and there are some very good benefits of modernity. For example, the fact that right now you're in Japan, I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, hmm. and we can have a conversation. You see, there are some good things about modernity. And the idea of the Dharma Manifesto is in no way the idea of rejecting modernity outright. Rather, the idea is indeed to reject, let's say, the excesses of modernity, that is the negative aspects of modernity that have brought about our present society in which the culture is one of meaninglessness, of nihilism, etc. So there are certain, certainly some things that we are opposed to in modernity. But at the same time, no, we don't reject everything. So the idea is looking at society the way that we have it presently structured. How can we take these positive and eternal values of dharma, of the natural law, and instantiate them again? very politically, very overtly. What would it look like? What, it, what would a Vedic or Dharmic government look like? What would the exact policies and economic policies, uh, foreign policies even, etc., what would these look like? So that's the idea. It's a book that is both, let's say, a combination of philosophy, but then also very practical. And trying to explain to people, especially individuals, who find that they themselves are followers of the Vedic tradition, but again, they either don't know much about what do the Vedic scriptures have to say about politics, or even worse, they've injected their own, uh, let's say, very life-negating sort of political philosophy, grafted that artificially onto Sanatana Dharma, and thus are led astray. So that's the purpose of the book. I hope that wasn't too long an answer. No, no, no. That's great. That's great. You know, um, I'm just I'm looking at if there's a in the book there's a nice. Uh, Section it says what we stand for is got ten, with ten points, and I'd like to read number two because it really popped out. We can go through some some of these, but and have you talk sure. about it. But it says Dharma nationalism strives always for order over chaos, beauty over ugliness, harmony over conflict, the natural over the artificial, the absolute over the relative. Uh, I think we can look around the world and see that uh, right now <laughs> uh, we certainly we, can, we see it playing out in the United States. We can see this uh, all over the world where we see chaos, the celebration of ugliness, the celebration of conflict, uh, you know, the opposite of all these things. Um, so if you could talk about, you know, the importance of these things of, of uh, and and maybe also the situation we see now where we have this very kind of anti-dharmic, you know, unnatural situation in the world where media and many and many people who have power in government, uh, in the corporate world, in the business world, are pushing ugliness, conflict. Uh, it's it's a very strange situation we find ourselves in. And if you could just talk about that. Absolutely. In fact, if you don't mind, can you tell me what page that's on? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is on uh, it, this is this is uh let's see it's on my Kindle so oh I see okay well never mind that's all right yeah it's just that if I if it's... I oh actually I just found it page thirty five very good okay great it's referred to this it's interesting actually yeah this is actually a very very important point of the Dharma Manifesto so that's why I wanted to know the exact page number but I would love to address this absolutely and I'm not surprised that you would yourself kind of hone in on this because again it's a very important point. In fact, before I actually address this exact point of the Dharma Manifesto, uh, with your permission, I would like to actually mention one uh, important foundation that will lead up to this. And that is this. One of the important theses of the Dharma Manifesto is indeed this. 
that what we find in the world today is actually a very stark contrast of two opposing worldviews. The first of them being dharma, natural law. And of course, the vast, vast, vast majority of human beings in the world being good, being honorable, being individuals who wish the best for themselves, their family, etc. Most of the people in the world, I would say, would indeed be on the side of good, would be on the side of dharma, you know, of the natural way, natural law, etc. But then on the other hand, what we have seen is that historically there has been this countervailing force, this other force that has been at odds with dharma, with the natural way. And of course, you and I have spoken about this in the past, and I know you yourself, in many of your of your broadcasts, you've spoken about this, that there has indeed been this evil cabal of individuals who they represent a minority. These people are, they're, they're quite tiny. They're a tiny elite of truly evil individuals. You can call them the New World Order. You know, people call them many interesting things, Illuminati, the cabal, et cetera, et cetera. In America, we call them the deep state. But there has been this force of truly evil individuals, and it's it's a group of people who have indeed controlled our world for a very long time. But in addition to actually being billionaires who control the world in so many ways, like you said, through the media, through academia, through government, bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera, they have also had many, uh, let's say, lower level sorts of movements that have essentially followed their interests, who have pushed their interests. This includes communism, anarchism, just so many different movements that we see today. Uh, today, of course, uh, literally today, just in the last few months, such movements as uh, what's called BLM, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, etc. These are all indeed demonic movements that do not exist in their own right, but are themselves just peons. They are themselves just puppets of, interestingly, billionaires. And the amount of research that would be necessary to confirm this is minuscule. <laughs> you, a yeah. person literally just has to scratch the surface and the information is there. All of these so-called movements of the people, they're not funded by the people, they're funded by billionaires, individuals like George Soros, the Rothschilds, etc. But in any case, that represents the opposite force. So to sum this up, you have the force of good, the force of dharma, of natural law on the one hand, that represents the vast majority of the human population, but then you have these other individuals who are a minority. These people are Luciferian, these people are narcissistic sociopaths, psychopaths. These, This is the elite cabal that has been the countervailing force trying to eliminate dharma from the world. Now, all that being said as just a historical foundation. As far as what is being said here as one of the points of the Dharma Manifesto, yes, indeed, you see the stark contrast. On the one hand, what are we seeing in the world today? And this is throughout the world, but certainly it's especially in America. What we see is that these evil forces do indeed celebrate chaos. They celebrate destruction. They celebrate rioting. They celebrate breaking the law. They represent everything that is evil in this world. And evil, why? See, it's one thing to just say something is evil. People will throw that word around. Oh, such and such is evil. This is evil. That's evil. Well, how do you know what is truly evil? Well, very simply, that which harms the people versus helps the people. See, all, these, all this rioting that's going on is helping no one. In fact, on the contrary, it's hurting. It's hurting businesses. It's hurting families. There are quite literally innocent individuals who have been attacked by these Antifa and BLM forces and beaten. There have been police officers who have been killed, etc. So how do you know whether or not something is good or evil? You look at the fruits. Mm -hmm. You look at the fruits thereof. If something is good, it doesn't cause uh, unnecessary harm. And what we see with all these various movements is indeed they harm everything from buildings burnt to the ground, businesses destroyed. You know, let me just talk about that for a second. People don't quite understand this. What is truly tragic is that these individuals who, oh, they'll call themselves socialists and anarchists and they're in favor of the little person. Very often they destroy family owned businesses. See, they don't go after massive corporations. Why? The massive corporations support them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. This is the this is the hypocrisy of it that is on the one hand humorous, on the other hand tragic. 
they don't go after the map. They're, they're not going to go after the Google headquarters. They're not going to go after Facebook headquarters. They're not going to st uh, try to set YouTube on fire. No. What do they go after instead? They go after l actually the little person. They go after these small businesses that are owned by some family who, in many cases, these people had nothing before they struggled and struggled to start this little business. And now, finally, after so much hardship, they have a little business going, whether it's a cafe, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a little clothing boutique, whatever it is. And what do these demonic individuals, these communists, what do they do? They burn it to the ground. They destroy a family business. So, again, how do we know that these people are evil? Because, again, it's easy for me or anyone to just throw this word around. You look at the harm that they cause. And interestingly, they are causing harm to the ordinary person, just ordinary innocent people. That's the definition of evil. But now getting back to this, yes, indeed, these individuals celebrate chaos. We good people, on the other hand, you know, myself, yourself, the vast majority of people in, in both of our audiences, we celebrate order. We wish to have a society in which we know that we and our families are safe where there is justice, where there is peace, where we can walk the streets without being accosted for some reason or another, where uh, if we if we need some sort of justice, there is a system that we can approach, where we can go to the court system, etc. We want to live in a society where there can be people of different viewpoints who can very peacefully debate these viewpoints without yelling and screaming, without threatening to harm each other, etc., this is the nature of order. This is the nature of dharma, the natural way. This is what we seek. Further, again, just to go down this list, yes, these individuals, the demonic individuals, unfortunately, celebrate ugliness. I won't go very, very deeply. All you need to do, let me just say this, is look at the, uh, just look at the aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic, let's say, values of individuals who indeed are themselves evil. They themselves tend to be very ugly people. Yep. Whereas we, on the other hand, we celebrate beauty. See, they want to tear down statues. They want to destroy art. See, a statue is a statue. A statue can represent something you like or don't like. But above all, it is art. It is something that was created by an artist who was commissioned and who, from the depths of his artistic being, decided to create something of beauty. And we celebrate art. We don't have to agree with it. Just as long as, you know, again, the artist is legitimately expressing that aesthetic, let's say, sense that he has or she has in their soul, and thus they want to produce a work of art. These evil people, on the other hand, want to destroy art. And that's why they're tearing down statues through, throughout America. It's not merely political. It's something worse than that. They want to destroy the, uh, the aesthetic sensibilities of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. See, this is an aspect of all this statue destroying that people don't talk about, interestingly, that indeed the, these evil people want to celebrate ugliness. We want to celebrate beauty. Let me just look at this for a moment, see what else there is. Harmony over conflict. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. This is one of the, let's say, main theses of the Dharma Manifesto, the idea that what natural law seeks to create in society is harmony. And what's meant by that? You look at any society, especially in the 21st century, and this is true especially for Western societies. So let's say uh, the United States and, and Canada, this is true for Europe as well. What do you see? You see that there is great diversity in our cultures. There is class diversity, diversity of opinion, etc. Well, the Vedic way, the Dharmic way, the way of natural law is that you recognize that, yes, there are diverse people with different, uh, different views, different points of view, etc. And what are you to do with this diversity? Well, the Dharmic way is that indeed we want to have harmony between all these people. That yes, we don't have to be cookie cutter expressions of one another. No, we can be different. We can be different. Well, what are we to do with these differences? Indeed, try to harmonize them peacefully in such a way that society can function in a wonderful way. That's the Vedic idea of what we do with diversity. 
The demonic idea, on the other hand, whether you want to call it the Marxist idea or the Luciferian idea, is that when they see diversity, rather than trying to bring about harmony, they see a vicious opportunity that is there where they can exacerbate all those divisions that are there in society and make people start to clash with each other. Mm -hmm. Thus, you'll notice, you know, the word racism, racism, racism gets thrown around probably more than than any other word in the English language. Pro I'm just guessing probably the word racism is used more than the word God today. Yeah. <laughs> and what is fascinating is that it is always the left. It is always, again, the Marxists who exacerbate race. They are the ones who are always seeking conflict about race. They are the ones who divide individuals racially. Thus, you're not American. You're an African-American. You are an Asian-American. And uh, an, an entire list that only increases as every moment goes on, it seems. You know, all this idea of the hyphenated American, that you are a blank American, not really an American. Well, this all finds its origin 100% again in, among the left. So where they see division, what they seek is indeed conflict. Let's take all these divisions in society, the workers, uh, the proletariat versus, let's say, the business people, uh, races against each other, uh, women against men, men against women. Let's have all the religions clash, et cetera, et cetera, and on and on and on. So indeed, they celebrate conflict. You know, whereas we, on the other hand, we celebrate harmony among all things. And then finally, the absolute versus the relative. Yes, unfortunately, uh, Marxism, leftism, Luciferianism, et cetera, et cetera, believes that everything is relative. They are, they are nihilistic in nature. That is, they do not believe that there is an absolute. They don't believe in God. They don't believe that there is truth. They don't believe that there is right versus wrong, that there is good versus bad. They believe that the ends justify the means. We, on the other hand, that is individuals who are spiritual, we believe the very opposite of that. We believe that there are indeed absolutes and that these absolutes are not man-made, but that these absolutes are divinely made, that they are divinely sourced. So thus we believe that there is indeed God, that there is that being than which nothing higher can be conceived and that God is the source of all reality and that God is absolute. We believe that there is indeed morality and ethics, that there is such a thing as right versus wrong. That we believe that there is indeed such a thing as truth and truth is attainable. Truth is something that is knowable. If we use our own reasoning, honest reasoning capacity, if we rely indeed on the revelations that were given to us in scriptures, etc., we can indeed discern truth from falsehood and that there is one and the other. There is truth and there is falsehood and more, ethically, we are to reject the false and embrace the true. So this is something also that, again, spiritual people, individuals, the sort of people who would very much agree with the Dharma Manifesto, we believe that there are indeed absolutes in the world and that the best way to govern society is to govern society in accordance with those absolutes. When you govern society in accordance with relativity, what do you have? That is the definition of anarchy. That is the definition of there being no rules in society and society itself becoming animalistic, where how do you know whether an individual or a group or an ideology is right versus wrong? Well, they were mightiest. They were the most brutal. They won. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what we want. What we want is, again, reasoned discourse and debate. We want that individuals who have differences of opinion have the opportunity and the ability to peacefully debate with each other and in that way come to what is a logical conclusion about the nature of truth, whether spiritual, philosophical, or political. But instead, if you live in a relativistic world, well, there is no truth. So whoever's strongest wins. Thus, this is why, again, these demonic individuals are so violent because they have no reason or logic or facts on their side. All they have is indeed animalistic violence. Thus, we see riots. Yes, indeed. You know, one of the, the great the lies, you're talking about truth and lies, and I, perhaps the central lie, or certainly one of the central lies uh, used by these people is the lie of equality and uh, 
again, in the same section, uh, you address this and you say, we uphold the values of hierarchical diversity over that of radical egalitarianism. And for my listeners, egalitarianism, basically, you know, equality, the idea that everyone's equal. And we have to remember, you know, when you say equal, if you think of math, two plus two equals four, it means same, right? So they're saying everyone's the same. And uh, in your book, you're saying quite the opposite of this, that there's uh, there are hierarchies that not only, first of all, obviously, we can all see in truth, it's obvious, we all know everybody's not the same. We, we can, they don't look the same. We don't act the same. We don't think the same, we, right? There's no sameness, even in, even in nature, among animals, among plants, right? We're not the same, which doesn't mean uh, better or worse, but certainly no, there's not a, a sameness. And we also can see hierarchies in nature, very obvious. Um, but, you know, we're kind of one of the central lies is the, the denial of all of this. So if you could talk about this, this as well, this, this, how does this play out? You know, hierarchical diversity. In other words, this idea that we're not equal, no, nobody's equal, but uh, how can we have truth and freedom and goodness n while also seeing that, okay, we're not all the same? Mm -hmm. Sure. And this is, uh, this is a very, very important, very crucial, very big topic. But it's something that I'm very, very happy that you, you want to address. Yes, the idea of, of egalitarianism, what I call radical egalitarianism versus equality is a very tricky one. Because, of course, when people hear, oh, we're not all equal, well, what does that mean? That tends to sometimes scare some people, people yeah. who have been brainwashed for generations uh, with this notion that equality, 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 this is our number one, this is our primary value in existence. And not understanding that, no, there is a lot of nuance when it comes to the idea of equality. So, for example, <clears throat> the idea of equality under the law is something that is different from qualitative equality. Right. You know, so this is where people get this mixed up. When we say that we are opposed to radical egalitarianism, well, does that mean that anyone who, let's say, is before a judge, that they're all going to be dif treated differently, that there won't be an equal application of law? No, of course not. Law is law and law has to be has to be uh, has to be done in a in a very equal way in accordance with with uh, human nature with with what human beings are. This is not what we're talking about, however, when we're talking about the idea of radical egalitarianism. The idea of radical egalitarianism, which is more communism than anything, interestingly, yeah. is what exactly what you said. You just gave it the perfect qualification. It's the idea that everyone, everyone, is exactly the same. And this may sound like a radical statement, but this is the foundation of communism. Yeah. It is the foundation of Marxism. Indeed, the idea that everyone is exactly the same. So much so that people forget this. You know, in communist China during Mao Zedong, you know, when he was still alive, people forget about the fact that they, that is these Chinese communists, took this idea of radical egalitarianism to such an insanely strict degree to the point where every man, woman, and child in China had to dress exactly the same. Yeah. They wore Mao suits. <laughs> Do you remember that from the <laughs> yep, 70s? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone literally had to dress the same. It didn't matter if you were man, woman, how old you were. It didn't matter what your job was, nothing. So yes, this is not a joke that in accordance with communism, everyone is, exact, is exactly the same and is uh, I was going to say treated the same, but that's not quite true. As we know, there's a lot of hypocrisy in, in communism. Uh, communism is nothing but hypocrisy. We know that even in, in the strictest communist societies, Marxist, Leninist societies that have existed, of course, they say that, oh, we're all exactly the same. But of course, if you're high up in the Communist Party, oh, you're not the same. You can be extremely wealthy. You'll have your own mansions. You'll have your own Mercedes Benz as a fleet of them. You'll have power, et cetera, et cetera. But in any case, let's just say theoretically, the idea is ra is one of, yes, radical sameness. I think, yeah, the, uh, what, it's an animal farm. What uh, Everyone's equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And interestingly, I mean, this is kind of a humorous aside, but of course, we see that in American politics as well in Western politics, where we've seen that even the law does not necessarily apply to our elite the same way that it does for for other people. So thus, a lot of corrupt politicians, people who probably should have been in prison 
30, 40 years ago are just walking around freely and having book deals, et cetera. Yeah. Whereas a common person who, if they broke the same law, they'd be buried under the prison. So yes, this idea of radical, radical equality, radical sameness, uh, this is always the hypocrisy of the left. They say this, but they don't practice it among their own, their own. Right. But all that being said, so again, there is this atheistic idea of indeed radical sameness, but at the same time, what is not recognized is that we are all indeed persons. See, one of the uh, one of the e most evil things about atheism, Marxism, etc., is the eradication of personhood and taking individual persons, individual human beings, and essentially making them into atomized little monadic units of of uh, of economic, uh, let's say, of economic. Uh, quality. So this is the idea of communism, is indeed not seeing persons, not seeing the personality that is there, but rather seeing everyone as basically rob robotic automatons who are soulless. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, this is the problem. Again, being atheistic, the idea of, again, these evil people is that we're all interchangeable. We're all just two-legged animals. Yes, it's nice that we have this added benefit that we can speak and we can think. But the truth of the matter is we're all interchangeable. You are no, no, no different from me. I'm no different from any other human, et cetera, et cetera. There is no looking beyond merely the physical presence of the person. So this being the case, what does this lead to? It leads to an absolute, absolute dehumanization of the individual person. See, this is the thing. In a, in again, a talk that's going to be released within the next few weeks, actually, that I gave just this, um, just this weekend. I mentioned this: how when I, as a spiritual person, when I look at a human being, when I look at a person, when I look at you, any person I can encounter. What I realize is that more than just the surface level, there is an infinite ocean of unique personality that is there. Every person is unique, yeah. but you can't necessarily see that. You have to get to know the person. There is a quality of being that is there with every person, which if you follow the Marxist model, you don't even look at that. Yeah. You give that uh, no consideration whatsoever. Again, just a body. There's a, a body in motion, another body in motion. How can I exploit them? That's how the Marxist thinks. But for us, when we look at one person, we realize that person is an infinite ocean of possibility, of personality, of emotion, of spirit, etc. Now, that being said, this is especially why Yes, we take a qualitative hierarchical approach when it comes to all things, really, but also when it comes to human beings. See, the idea of hierarchy, and you know, I've said this one once before in uh, a different interview I did with someone, but uh, it bears repeating. You know, I have this uh, the title of a book that I want to write at some point in the future, <laughs> mm -hmm. and the name of the book very simply, and I even have an outline already for the book. I just have to sit down and write it. The name of the book is. The dirtiest word, <laughs> a study in the nature of hierarchy, because, again, hierarchy has today become a dirty word. People don't understand what this word means. Right. Well, hierarchy is based 100 percent on nature. Nature is hierarchical. In fact, if anything, this is one of the most important definitions that you can give to the, the way of nature is that it is hierarchical. What does that mean exactly? It means that nature looks at, again, individual things, whether it's animals, whether it's small categories, big categories. It doesn't matter what it is that you're looking at within nature, but everything is ordered in accordance with what I was just saying, that internal aspect of what the thing is. So thus, you look at, you look at all the qualities of anything in nature and some can be seen as, yes, more important than others, more functional than, than others, of more value than others, more skillful than others, more beautiful than others, et cetera, et cetera. This is how nature orders itself in such a way that it is a perfect system. Those, those objects that are higher on the scale of ontological hierarchy are those objects that share in their nature God's nature to the closest approximation. Hmm. 
And then conversely, those things that are lower, let's say, on the, hi on the hierarchical scale are those things that share in God's nature the least. Mm -hmm. Very simple. That's how nature itself functions. But more, looking at human beings, we can say the very same thing about human beings. Again, if you look at each individual person, not as a thing, but as truly a, a, a living being with personality, what we see is that we're all different. No one, no two people anywhere in creation are exactly the same. No two people, again, when you look past the surface, if you are a not very sophisticated individual and all that you can see is the surface level, then sure, you'll see a lot of similarities. All right, this is a human, that's a human. Uh, that's an almost animalistic sort of perceptual approach that a person can take. That's an individual who doesn't have any depth to them. But then if you do have some depth, if you do have some intelligence, you indeed go deeper. Oh, these are not just two humans. These are two people who now that I get to know them, their interests are different. Their experiences are different. What they like, what they don't like, what their skill level is, their, uh, their intelligence, their IQ, uh, their innate wisdom, their innate lack of wisdom. And you can go on infinitely into all these differences and you can see that some have skills that others don't. Mm -hmm. And then indeed looking even at the physical, you see, this is just looking at the internal, yeah. which again, you can explore infinitely. Even if you look at the physical, People are not the same. Some people are born taller, some shorter, some with more strength, some less. Some people have debilitating illnesses that they've had genetically since birth. Some are in perfect health. And you see how there's this infinite complexity. Yes. So what does this, what does this teach us? Number one, and this is just the very base, let's say the very foundational thing. Number one, yes, people are not the same. <laughs> and anyone who tries to uh, predicate their ideas or try to build a society based on these on the idea that people are all the same. Oh my God, they're going they are destined for failure because people are not the same. That's the first thing. Second, it's not merely that people are not the same. But indeed, we need to accept the fact that when it comes to certain skills, certain proclivities, etc, some people are better in some ways than others. Yeah. You see, let me let me give you an example a very uh, just dealing with myself. Some people are better in some ways than others. Now, I'm a very intellectual person. Yes, not everyone can think philosophically. Let's say maybe in that way I'm better than someone else. Yeah. But guess what? I know nothing about all the mechanics. If I suddenly had a, <laughs> if I had a problem with my car, what would I do? I would bring my car to someone who was better at cars than me. I don't know how to fix cars. I, I could, you know, I, I can change a tire. I can do some things. But let's say I have some sort of serious mechanical problem with my car. What am I going to do? Bring my car to someone who is better than me at fixing cars. Right. So you see how this is how this beautiful complexity of this diverse world around us works in a hierarchical fashion such that, A, you accept people for who they are. You don't try to artificially deny these differences. You see, that is what modern society has done. We have tried artificially to deny the differences. No, we're meant to embrace the differences. Yes, recognize, yeah, that person is better than me at, at this, but I'm better than them at that, et cetera. Yeah. You recognize these, that's number one. But also, you harmonize the fact that we're all different. You see, the fact that we're all different, there are only two conclusions socially that we can then come to, that either A, because of these differences, we should all hate each other, and we should all be in conflict constantly, and just war with each other because, oh, look, everyone's different from me and I'm different from everyone. Let's just all hate each other. Or there's the better option. And this is the dharmic option. Recognizing that, yes, yes, we're all different. And you know what? It is all of these differences combined that create a harmonious and beautiful whole. Yes, indeed. See, you look at, you look at a beautiful, let's say, uh, a beautiful piece of classical music. You look at a beautiful, very complex painting. 
what are you really looking at? You're looking at a myriad of diverse elements that are put together to create that whole. You know, you look at, again, a work of music. What do you have? You have so many different instruments, all of which are contributing their own little element to then create what ultimately is a beautiful piece of, of music. Same thing with a work of art. You have a beautiful, very complex work of art in front of you. What are you looking at? Again, complexity. You're looking at many individual elements that are different, different colors, different shapes, different sizes, different everything, different te textures. But they are put together by a master artist in such a way that they all come together harmoniously to create a beautiful painting before us. So this is the idea of hierarchy. And hierarchy, again, was the way that all of humanity viewed reality up until, oh, just about 300 years ago. This idea of hierarchy being something bad that we are to reject, and nope, we're all the same, everything's the same, it's all the same. This is a modern idea that has led to nothing but suffering and uh, philosophical dishonesty. You know, it's, it's interesting you're, you're talking about uh, and using art as an example. And I think that 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 is why we can see it really shows the point of why, uh, you know, these whatever evil, demonic Marxist type people, why they are so ugly. I mean, they tend to be they they. They make themselves. What, what it is is they make themselves ugly. <laughs> you know, it's it's not just that they're I'm like perfect. born ugly. Uh, it's that they they make themselves ugly through uh, well various means, uh, being unhealthy, uh, the way they dress. But then when they the things they produce are ugly. I mean, all you have to do is look at um, architecture and the art that they make and compare it to, as you said, like the the ancients, the classics of uh, of. Uh, many different countries and cultures and objectively you know the classics the ancients are beautiful i mean any any person in just two seconds you can say oh that's that's far more beautiful uh and you know you kind of just explain that because um beauty requires that hierarchy and that complexity and when they're trying to artificially eliminate it and that produces ugliness i i, mm. I, I think there's a strong connection there you're absolutely correct. And in fact, can I say, you know, one more thing about that. Beauty requires spirit. Uh -huh. Beauty requires consciousness. It requires, a, it requires a spiritual sensibility more than anything. This is why if you go back throughout the history of all art, the history of the aesthetic, whether it's visual art, musical art, whether it's literature, whether it's poetry, what we see historically is that those most beautiful works of art were created by individuals who were inspired by the spiritual. So, yes, what do we see? These, these, uh, these modern demonic individuals, whether they are Marxists, Luciferians, uh, radical, secular atheists, etc., there are so many of these individuals. They celebrate, you're right, they celebrate ugliness. And as a result, everything that they produce is indeed the opposite of the aesthetic, the opposite of true beauty. So, yes, modern art is very often, not always, but very often something that is quite demonic and disturbing and very and very ugly in nature. Uh, oh, you mentioned architecture. Yes, architecture is, is one mm -hmm. of my one of my greatest interests. I love architecture. To me, in America, for example, the American Renaissance, what's called the American Renaissance era in architecture was for me the the uh, the apex of American architecture, rough, roughly roughly um, post uh, Civil War era to about uh, 1920 or so. Mm -hmm. You have some of the most beautiful buildings imaginable that were built in that in that era. Uh, versus versus again, what these people celebrate as uh, what's, what's sometimes called devastation architecture. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you that's know. A good it, word. <laughs> You see these buildings and they look like they were uh, they were the victims of a nuclear war or something. They look devastated. They, they look horrible. And then again, yes, unfortunately, you see that many of these individuals were, you know, Antifa type people. 
you know, I'll state more bluntly what you were very polite and you didn't want to say. They are truly ugly individuals. These are individuals who they tend to be obese. They're unhealthy. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if they had to jog for one block, you know, they would collapse in exhaustion. Uh, they have, you know, pink hair and they're obese with tattoos and piercings over <laughs> all over their skin. And they are just they are selling the walking epitomes of truly ugliness. Yeah ugliness but again it's it's fun it's funny to say this but why we need to why is this the case we need to look at the spiritual uh the spiritual reasons why this is the case it's because these people are empty it's because they are empty inside thus what ends up happening is because they're empty and dark and warped inside that becomes manifest externally versus on the contrary what do we see we see that individuals who are spiritual are individuals who are beautiful. Individuals who are spiritual are individuals who glow. They are healthy. They are individuals who, yes, they even look good. They are good, thus they look good, etc. And of course, it's not to say that there that there is an exact correlation. Oh, you can have some supposedly nice-looking people who are demonic too. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just a, a general statement. Of course, there are always exceptions. But yes, these people not only are ugly, but they consciously, purposefully celebrate ugliness yes, in indeed. everything they do, in all their values, but also in, yes, all of their, uh, yeah, just everything that they, that they prefer aesthetically, from music, you know, uh, gangster rap, <laughs> to, again, <laughs> ugly architecture, ugly everything, green, pink hair, etc. They, yeah. <laughs> I'm just realizing, wow, we're, uh, wow, man, time flies. Um, Tell you what, if if we do you have just a few more minutes is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, so so far we've covered like maybe 1% of the content. I know, the I know. Yeah, it's uh, every <laughs> time, time is it's already so much. Old. It's a deep, it's a deep book. It's a yeah. very deep book and we've covered like 1%. <laughs> I think we should but end please, yes. kind of at, at right at the center which you've been uh getting to, I'd say, is uh which is that all of this then is is founded upon spirituality, God, and that this is really uh, what I see is is the root, right? In terms of the difference uh, of whether you're talking about art and ugliness, whether you're talking about harmony, whether we're talking about uh, you know a peaceful, good society versus the opposite. That if we just keep digging down, right? What, as you said that. If we look again at that, those that kind of classical period of, let's say, art and architecture, at least, at least outwardly, you know, what you find is a lot of most of those artists were talking about that they were creating as a celebration to God, whatever their personal, you know, some of them were 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 godly and some were not, but uh, but this at least was their stated motivation, which is whereas now, I, you know, you see in art, it tends to be more about their, their personal ego. It's about their own issues or whatever and i think that also kind of we can connect that out to we see that it's the same in politics and everything else where uh, it's this whether we call it materialism or ego or power and what's missing is the spiritual and and if you could just mm -hmm. comment on that i think that might be a good way to finish oh absolutely i mean in order to understand what is the nature of our world today we can actually understand this in in rather rather a simple way but at the same time nothing is more true than this the reason why human beings have been suffering so much for the last several hundred years is precisely because the corrupt leaders of society for several hundred years now made a decision and that is spirituality is bad we must remove every single vestige of spirituality from society incrementally little by little with the idea of eventually there being no spirituality left and nothing but a materialistic world order yeah that decision was made several hundred years ago and what have we seen we've seen that for several hundred years oh we have smartphones now hooray <laughs> yeah we have computers now hooray uh, we have some we have a few benefits of society but on the other hand, when it comes to actual human beings on a mass scale, human beings are miserable now. Yeah. Human beings are floating around society 
in this in this uh, in this almost trance like state of not knowing who am I? Why am I actually here? What is actually my purpose in life? People are living a life without purpose. You know, in modern society, what is our purpose? Our purpose, if you go through the uh, this um, secular educational system, if you go through the media, etc., our purpose is to be good workers. That's it. Worker drones. Otherwise, as far as any deeper purpose than this, we are trained to not think too deeply. Otherwise, oh, if you think any more, any more deeply than, 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 oh, how can I be a better worker? Oh, there must be something wrong with you. Right. Yes, all meaning has, has been eradicated. So as a result, what do we have very practically? And this is very practical. You know, people often accuse spirituality of not being practical, and it's just the opposite. What do we have practically? We have hundreds of millions, if not billions, of individuals who are in misery. We have people who are depressed. We have people committing suicide. We have people taking drugs, drinking alcohol, getting uh, getting blackout drunk. We have families breaking apart. We have children who are running around in the streets not knowing, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? With no guidance, no purpose, with no direction in life, with no goals. You know, eventually, eventually, maybe when they're in their 20s, if they're lucky, they'll eventually stumble upon a job because they have no choice but to support themselves eventually, et cetera. What we have is a broken down society and globally. This is not by accident. This didn't just happen to occur. This happened because again, this evil cabal of individual, of individuals, this these elites who have controlled society for several hundred years now, decided that this is how it will be. They decided to, to eliminate God and to eliminate spirituality from culture. As right. a result, when you eliminate God and spirituality from culture, do you know what you have left? You don't have a materialistic scientific culture. When you eliminate God and spirituality from culture, what you have left is nothing. Yeah. What you have left is no culture. And that's what we have, unless you want to consider the latest offerings from Disney and Hollywood culture, right. which it's not. It's garbage. Right. And that's all we have. That's what we're left with. That's what we're left with. Uh, let's see what's the the latest big blockbuster uh, with 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 talking robots and explosions that Hollywood is going to offer us next week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is the deepest meaning and purpose of our lives today. Well, that's not a life. That's not a life. That is the opposite. That is nothingness. That is nihilism. So to end this on a or not necessarily end, I'll leave it up to you. But at least this segment to end this on a positive note. What are we to do? Well, <laughs> this is what the Dharma Manifesto is about. What we need to do is to reclaim God, to reclaim the spiritual, to reclaim Dharma and the natural way. What we are to do is indeed to realize that while this evil cabal has done everything in its power to eradicate spiritual meaning from our culture, now we as individuals and families and <laughs> movements, organizations, whoever is out there who wishes to do this, we are to reclaim the spiritual and to reverse this process of destruction that has been imposed upon us against our will for hundreds of years. We now, the good people of this planet, are to reclaim power again and humbly in God's name. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I highly recommend everyone get this book and read it. Um, I think that's a great way to, to end it. Thank you so much again. Um, yeah, powerful, powerful. It, it was great to talk to you. Um, I try, uh, I, as you said, I mean, we could talk hours and hours. <laughs> May, uh, perhaps we could just do a follow up. I'll, uh, I'll just, we could talk about a different section of the book or we'll, 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 we'll we can discuss. I'll, I'll email you and we can figure out, you know, what, what to talk about next time. But uh, we'll, we'll thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, there's so much to. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yes, indeed. And uh, I hope to see you next time you have a conference. I hope to meet you in person. Absolutely. And again, thank you so much for having me on. You are always a fantastic, wonderful interviewer. And I love your enthusiasm, your goodness, and your sincerity. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll see you next time. Okay. Take care, AJ. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, I noticed in the comments, some of you... Had a hard time with this discussion. 
Some of you are having a hard, a difficult time. Why? This is a very philosophical uh, topic. Let me just deal with my comments here. All right. Uh, so this is a philosophical uh, discussion. Artaya is a very intelligent person, and uh, he was using perhaps some difficult vocabulary for some of you, for many of you, perhaps. So what can you do if you were listening and you're like, oh, my God, I can't understand a lot. I recommend there are a few things you can do. Number one, I recommend listen again. Go back and listen again. Uh, when you have something difficult like this, uh, sometimes if you just go and you listen a few times, you know, the first time is going to be the most difficult, right? You're hearing it the first time. It's coming. You're not sure. You know, what, what is he saying? What are these new words? Oh, my God. Uh, it's difficult and you're, you're not catching it. But if you go back and listen to the recording, maybe not just one time, but listen two times, three times, five times, ten times, you will start to understand more. There's maybe there will be many words, still many words you don't know, but you can, if you listen a lot, you can, if you repeat a lot, you can start to guess the meaning of some of those new words. And when you listen again and again and again, many times, you will start to understand more and more of the general topic right? The general idea. Okay, so this was advanced today. I'll just, you know, this was advanced English today. It don't feel bad if you had a, if today's interview you, you thought was difficult. Well, that's because it was difficult. <laughs> it was difficult. It was advanced. That's okay. That's why I do these interviews. You know, uh, I think a lot of you know and notice that, you know, I'm easier to understand because the way I speak, I, I'm, I don't use slang. I tend to use pretty much common, uh, the most common vocabulary. So I do, I do these interviews and I love interviewing people like Acharya who are quite intelligent and I'm giving you uh, an advanced level of English. It's a nice test today for you and your English. You know, how much did you understand today? Some of you maybe understood a lot and some of you, I can see in the comments, some of you uh, had a hard time and like, oh, I don't understand much. So it's just practice. You need more vocabulary. The re if you had trouble with Acharya's, uh, Acharya's uh, English today, it's because of vocabulary. Okay, his his pronunciation is excellent. His speaking, his speed is not he's, he's not so fast. Just kind of average speed. So I think those two things not so difficult. But what maybe was more advanced, what what is more advanced with his speaking is his vocabulary. Because we're talking about uh, philosophical topics. So he's using more, you know, I would say, you know, advanced, educated uh, vocabulary. So this is a good opportunity. It's a very good opportunity to learn some of that vocabulary and to understand uh, more complicated uh, vocabulary. Because this was a very, very interesting discussion. So I recommend... If you had any trouble, go back and listen again. Not just one time, but listen five times, listen 10 times, listen 20 times. You know, the, I, you do the same with my lessons. Listen many times and you will get more and more and more understanding, more and more and more you'll understand. And uh, this is a great way to improve your listening. Challenge yourself sometimes. Yes, many times listen to easier English. That's good. Sometimes listen to something like this that's very philosophical, perhaps difficult for you, so you just need more repetition, okay? The first time is hard. Listen again, listen again, listen again. Next time when I interview Acharya, you probably will understand him better. You'll understand more, okay? So don't feel bad. Don't feel bad if it was difficult. It was difficult, but that's okay. Okay, I'm just, gonna, just scanning comments very quickly. I think speed is not important while conversing with others. Would you agree? Yeah, that's right. Speed. You, you don't need to speak fast. I don't speak fast. Quickly, if we want to be 100%. Good. So Zana says, it was an extraordinary experience for me. Thank you, teacher. I will listen to your interview again and again and again. Great. And I know that some of you who are more advanced did understand a lot and quite enjoyed it. I could see also that in the comments as well which is great. 
Celia says, in my opinion, people who have a spiritual life live in peace. Indeed. Yes, indeed. So there are lots of good stuff. Now, the other thing you can do to help you understand and get a lot of this great vocabulary is reading because reading is easier. For learning vocab, reading is much easier than listening only. You need both. But, you know, read the book because then you can go slowly. The great thing about reading, as we know, is you can go very slowly. There's no, you don't have to hurry. There's no speed problem. With listening, there's a speed problem, right? It's coming very quickly. So let me just show you the cover of the book. So this is a great way. You can get a lot of this great vocab. You'll understand the topic he's talking about. There's a lot more in this book. We only talked about a small part of it today. Um, so it's called the Dharma, whoops, cover. The Dharma Manifesto. Dharma is D-H-A-R-M-A. -A. Dharma this is the idea of natural law, God's law. It's the same, it's similar ideas. Logos. You'll see these different words used to describe something, the same basic idea. Dharma. Dharma is the Eastern uh, word for this. D-H-A-R-M-A, -A, or the Vedic. Dharma, and then manifesto. M-A-N-I-F-E-S-T-O, manifesto is like a writing, something that's written. The Dharma Manifesto. Look it up. You can get it on Amazon or another booksellers, I'm sure. You can also get it on his website, Dharma Central. So this is a great way. What I'd recommend if you're interested in this topic, you know, uh, spirituality and, and politics, logos, natural law, philosophy, if you like these kind of topics, I do, then uh, I recommend get the book. Get the book and read through the book. Go slowly. Learn. You can learn a lot of vocabulary from this book. Then listen again to the interview many times. Read the book some more. Listen to the interview. You're going to get a huge increase in your vocab and you'll understand uh, you know, this kind of higher level topic, not just talking about weather, the weather and small talk and pop culture. Those, those are okay topics, but uh, it's nice to be able to talk about something a little more intellectual, a little more deep and meaningful. All right, guys. So that's it. I'll be back again. We will start our new book club, by the way. Charisma on Command is the new book. We'll see. Uh, hopefully, maybe we'll do it tomorrow. I'll try to do it tomorrow or this weekend, let's say. I'll try to do it this weekend. We'll do. We'll start Charisma on Command, do the first. Go ahead, read the first three chapters. Read chapter one, two, and three of that book, Charisma on Command. We're going to learn how to be more likable, more charismatic is a nice word, charisma. Uh, it's going to be very good for your English speaking, by the way. Very good, this book. I think it's excellent. All right, and I'll answer this super chat because I, th I thank you for the donation of $5. I appreciate it. Uh, if I want to start improving my English, which course should I take first, VIP or pronunciation? I'm shy when talking to people. On, I would say VIP first. You want to work on your fluency first, you know, the getting getting enough words, under, get your listening uh, to a higher level, you know, improve your speaking. And then when you're ready, if you if you think you need a pronunciation uh, improvement, if, if that's a problem for you then you could do the pronunciation course uh, after that or you could do both at the same time the good thing the pronunciation course you can use with anything else so you could do both if you want to but if you need to choose one choose VIP first that's my advice all right so on my screen if you're watching on video you'll see Acharya's um, website Dharma Central Dharma Central dot com if you're interested in this book, the Dharma Manifesto, which is very interesting. It's kind of, you know, the spirituality and politics are, are the topics of this book. Really, really good. His other books are also excellent. Um, check out his website. Get, he's got a free uh, email course as well where you can get uh, several of his videos. It's really good. It's free. Just enter your email at dharmacentral.com. Lots of love to you all. Join my VIP program. Visit Dharma Central. See you next time. Bye for now.